come to order. Uh, members, we're still back on uh, Senate File 2673, Senator Limmer. But before um, we go back to the amendments, um, Senator Kent made a, a, a reasonable request and suggestion that from here on out the rest of the week and on no, April 19th, we will be having two major bills there at that time. We'll try to give you a better heads up as far as how this is going to work with committees and recess and so you can adjust a little bit. So very good suggestion. With that, uh, Senator Champion, you have a bill. Uh, Amendment. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would uh, 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 introduce the A52 amendment. Senator Champion moves the A52 amendment. Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Limmer. Um, the A52 amendment is something that I hope that uh, Senator Limmer will see as a friendly amendment. Uh, this is what I like to define as a, as a part of a comprehensive approach to public safety. I recognize that there are other things that have been put forward, but this, uh, uh, this amendment uh, comes out of the uh, work uh, with the County Attorneys Association, first of all, uh, which means it wasn't just folks who are from Hennepin or Ramsey County, but across the county. Judges who are specifically in, in juvenile uh, work, and then also public defenders um, and other community members. And the whole idea was to come together and think about public safety. Now, we recognize that there's a bifurcation between the adults, which we believe there are things that must be done, but this bill really <coughs> focuses on young people and really around prevention, intervention, deterrence, uh, how do we deal with out-of-home placement, whether it's short-term or long-term, and how do we make sure that communities across the great state of Minnesota have the opportunity to be resourced to react to how they think they should deal with public safety in their communities. I really didn't want a one-size-fit-all because I think uh, that we all need to <clears throat> think about how we address uh, various counties. We understand that we have 87 counties throughout this wonderful uh, uh, state, and, and those who are charged with working with young people can have their targeted approach resourced, and this is an opportunity for us to do that. And not to mention that I believe that uh, today we have an opportunity to create what I would call a transformative uh, opportunity. So the A52 sort of uh, puts forth resources for listening sessions because I think a part of uh, what needs to happen is listening sessions throughout the state so that they can solicit feedback from communities, local government units, nonprofits, and community organizations in order to say, hey, here's what we need to have happen in our community. Then, um, as you see on line 1.23, there's prevention service grants, and that is to be used to provide prevention services to prevent juveniles from entering the criminal or justice system. I recognize that, that we have some issues going on. I talked to a number of law enforcement folks, uh, and we understand that young people needs, need a different approach and attention so that they will uh, not even think about being a, a part of law-abiding, bad behavior, but how do we bring them back into law-abiding behavior, but how do we prevent it and build them up in order to be the great young people that we want them to be? Um, and then also, if you look at this, there's intervention service grants. If you look at 2.18, uh, this is uh, this is an opportunity for uh, various folks to be able to uh, provide I intervention services to support work to intervene on behalf of young, uh, uh, young people or youth who are interacting with the criminal justice system. Uh, and then there are grants to service that reduce barriers and invest in community. Uh, one of the things that I uh, understand very uniquely is that um, for, for, for quite some time now, counties and different folks have stepped away from investing in the services that need to happen in order to make sure that we deal with young people on, on every level. P 
prevention, intervention, and deterrence. Uh, how do we also make sure that counties have the resources if a young person needs to be out of the home for a short period of time or a longer period of time, but recognizing that their brain development does not stop until the age of 25, but how do we make sure that we are doing everything that we can in order to help young people? So this proposal, again, um, is an attempt uh, after me meeting with and, 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 and collaborating uh, as a part of county attorneys, uh, judges, as well as public defenders to deal with young people. Last but certainly not least, I recognize that Senator Limmer has put some money forward when we think in ter terms of youth intervention programming. Um, this is a direct uh, uh, response to those who are actively engaged, and, and, and I think that this is an important way by which to do it. And that is not to suggest that what he has there is, is, is bad, it's just not enough. I think that this is much more targeted, but also creates an opportunity for a wide a range of folks to be resourced. So that's the A52, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak uh, about the A52 amendment. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, Mr. Nauman. So, Madam Chair and members, I think it was your preference that I walk through the fiscal implications of this amendment. Um, there are four paragraphs here that have appropriations and tails, and in each case, um, there's a $10 million appropriation with a $15 million tail, beginning, uh, so $7.5 million each year. So in total, with four, with four appropriations and, and four tails, the total would be $100 million over the three-year projection period. Okay. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to ask Senator Champion, I had heard some discussion in the news or something recently talking about really the effect of the pandemic on so many of the organizations that historically have engaged in many of these activities, but because of some of the fiscal hardships that a lot of these organizations fa faced during the pandemic, because for so many people, if it was, say, charitable giving and support, that really kind of dried up for a lot of them. And so some of what I've been hearing is that you know, we're just really, we need to stand back up some of these important entities that have been doing this important work in our communities. Is that your understanding and is that part of why this is a, a, an important step to take at this particular moment? Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Kitt. Kent, thank you for, for the question. You are absolutely correct. Correct. A part of the discussions that I had with a cross-section of leaders, especially in this area of juveniles, they talked about the impact of the pandemic. They also talked about, um, even prior to the pandemic, some of the services were already drying up and how now we're seeing the impact of, of that lack of investment, for, for lack of a better word. Like, for an example, <clears throat> people criticize juvenile judges to say they're not being strong when it comes to young people, but if you don't have any services available to them, where are you gonna send them? What are you gonna order them to do? And we don't wanna send the wrong message to young people that we no longer value them or think it's important for them to uh, participate in what I would consider services, whether that's to address mental health, whether that's to address domestic violence, whether that's to even address truancy. Because we know if young people get on a pathway of believing that it's not important to go to school or find that there's some challenges, then we end up failing the young person and their family. So yes, those ser services have dried up and have really done so in a real accelerated way since the pandemic. And so I think this broad-based uh, investment and the opportunity for our uh, folks across the state to be able to apply for and showcase their uh, approaches in the various communities also helps not only that community, but for others to see best practices and, and, and things that they could do as well. So that's why I think it's really important for us to make this transformative investment. Thank you, Senator Champion. Okay. Senator Limmer. Thank you. Um, Senator Champion, I, I value what you're trying to do here. Uh, however, <clears throat> and I do believe there is there, uh, all of these elements that you have here are elements that we certainly have tried before and continue even at the present time, maybe not to this extent or in this detail. However, um, uh, after our committee created our budget 
and our leadership gave us a pinch more uh, to set as a spending limit. Um, an extra forty million dollars is going to blow the bank. So I just I I can't accept it. Uh, you've got some good noble things here, but uh, at this present time, we, as I said before, uh, we directed this bill to address the immediate. Uh, threat of violent crime that's growing in our state, and that's where we put our resources. Um, this may be an area for next year. This topic is something that we should consider in a regular budget year. Are you supposed to be in court? Is it a tornado? That's right. Under your desk, quick. I thought it was his blood pressure as I was talking. <laughs> That's right, the blood pressure. <laughs> well, I, well, I would say that Senator Limber did have my blood pressure rising right there. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, uh, Senator if Senator Champion. Limber was done, I just have one thing. Thank you, Senator Limber, for at least thinking about this. I ask that for you to continue to think about it even as this bill goes forward. Um, you and I had a brief conversation about it, and I know that you really do uh, believe that it's important to make these investments, and I recognize that you know, uh, 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 there's always another time, but I do really do think that now is the time and we have a unique opportunity in front of us. Lastly, what I'll say is <clears throat> the need is immediate, right? You know, I had a conversation with Commis Commissioner Harrington to say, well, what is, uh, uh, what, what is uh, uh, the attributing factors to some of the uh, uh, things we see going on in, in community? And one of the things that he shared with me was young people and that uh, there was, and he echoed what the judges and others had already said, which is programming that would be available to young people, opportunities that would be available to young people are no longer there. And so when they, when they do find themselves in the, in the juvenile justice system, and I want to make sure we say juvenile justice system, that uh, judges and, and prosecutors and others can't send them anywhere because there's no place for them to go. So it sends the wrong message uh, when they can go in and then they go out because now they don't see the consequences because it's not just a judge who is turning to the other cheek or t turning the other way or a prosecutor doesn't want to prosecute is because there are a lack of opportunities and I just want us to create more opportunities. So thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to speak and I hope that Senator Limmer, if you don't accept it today, that you'll continue to talk to me even as we uh, go uh, uh, into conference committee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Champion. Further comments, questions? Okay, Senator Champion renews his motion on the A52 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. No. Motion does not prevail. Madam Chair, I have one more. Senator Champion. Thank you. Um, um, I have one more amendment. I'd like to move the A53 amendment, Madam Chair. Senator Champion moves the A53 amendment. And Madam Chair, while that's being uh, 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 passed around, I'm not certain if, if Senator uh, Lopez uh, Franzen is on line or she needs me to go forward with the A53 amendment. Oh, Senator Champion, too, we have not posted this yet. We're, we're working there. Okay. And I did, um, I should, why it's being passed around, um, just let the committee know, Transfer, transportation starts at three. So if we're not done by three, we'll come back at five. Okay, I think everybody has it. It's posted yet. Okay. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, this is an amendment that uh, was put together by Senator Lopez Franzen as it pertains to the youth intervention program. Uh, as, as, as you can see, that there's a common theme for us to make these investments when it comes to young people, and it's my understanding uh, that, uh, that she's requesting to delete $3 million uh, and uh, insert 10 million is my understanding. Uh, uh, I should also see if uh, she wants that, that uh, insertion instead of being $10 million to be $5 million. So if, if I can make one uh, amendment to the A53 amendment, that's an oral amendment. Senator Champion makes an oral amendment on 
1.2 to delete $10 million and in place put $5 million. That would be correct, Your Honor, Your Honor. Madam Thank Chair. You. And so moved. Okay. Uh, Senator Limmer. <clears throat> Madam Chair and members, um, the YIP program is a particular program that I'm impressed with. Uh, it, uh, the, the programs are well vetted. Uh, they've been around for a while. Uh, occasionally you get a new program, but it's usually under the auspices of another organization that uh, we've dealt with before. Uh, they require uh, matching funds. Um, so investing in YIP uh, has results. Uh, we've tracked that. It's good to track these type of things uh, as opposed to brand new. My caution with brand new uh, nonprofits that want to get into the game, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I like the direction it's going. However, uh, I was given a spending limit on my bill. Uh, two million uh, would probably, an extra two million over the three would probably be a good thing uh, in this area, but I'm not authorized to grant that, so it, it'll be up to you or the committee on this, Madam Chair. Um, I'm trying to be as cautious as I can and not overstepping my, my authority of the limit that I was given. Mm -hmm. You're under, um, you're under a lot of pressure on your budget and uh, rightly so. Uh, and we have talked about a lot of pressures that are on your budget and we've talked about this and, um, Senator Lopez Franson did, uh, we did talk this morning about this. Um, she has been the author of uh, YIP for many years, and I believe I was the author years and years ago. Uh, it is uh, a program that, as you said, uh, Senator Limmer, it's been around a long time. As proven results, I think, you know, if you have a program such as YIP, you don't necessarily need the last amendment to that extent. Um, the, the reason I was late to committee is, was just talking to one of the family members that was, um, attacked by, um, some carjacking in St. Paul. And I, and just serving as the chair of the, just co-chair as for the justice reinvestment initiative. The amount of um, stories that came out of the woodwork um, and people that have been vandalized and traumatized. Uh, we do need to do something for our youth. And so, uh, Senator Limber, let's um, go ahead and accept this oral amendment from Senator Champion. And um, the tail is going to be six million. So, if but we will, um, we will do the math and we'll make it work. And if there's no further questions, any questions, members? Consider this a good amendment. Mr. Nauman. Madam Chair, for clarity, it would be $2 million in 23 and 4 million in 24 and 25 for the 6 million that I had just written down here. Okay, very good. Okay. Senator Champion, you good? With you, Madam Chair, I'm always good. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> He's so good. He took my line. <laughs> Senator Champagne renews his motion on the amended A53. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, I have the A55 amendment. Senator Marty moves the A55 amendment. And it has been posted. And, and Madam Chair, I can just briefly explain it. This is similar to what the legislature created in the past for an office of missing and murdered indigenous women. This is one for a similar situation where we have a huge number of missing and murdered 
black women and girls, and this is to create a similar office for the same amount of money to begin investigating and work at preventing and and stopping the violence against black women. And um, it would be very parallel. The language was designed to be very similar to what we have for um, the Indigenous Women's Office, and I would urge your support. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Lever. Uh, one moment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just got handed the amendment, so give me a moment to uh, review it. While you are looking at that, uh, Mr. Turner, can you tell us already what is in the base and what we, we do fund ongoing for the Office of Missing and Murdered uh, Women and what we've, what we've done in the past, please? Madam Chair, members, um, well, this would be the creation of missing and murdered black women and girls, so. Oh, excuse me. Madam Chair, this would be the creation of an office for missing and murdered black women and girls, so the, the current base for that is zero. Um, the legislature did create an office of missing and murdered indigenous women, which I believe is now named missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Um, I think I can, I can look it up in 30 seconds. I think the base for that is half a million a year. Ongoing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Turner. So, Senator Limmer. Well, Madam Chair, sure, um, <clears throat> welcome, welcome to the decisions we have to make in Judiciary Committee. Uh, everyone has a stake in the game, and yet at the same time, we have limitations on our budget. Um, this one in particular uh, came up. I, I can't recall right now if there was a task force that was created. Um, and that we were waiting a report. There's been so many task force reports uh, coming back to us. Uh, Senator Marty, do you remember if there was a task force and what the recommendations were? Uh, murdered and missing. Senator Marty. Women? Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, for the missing and murdered indigenous women when we had a task force that led to the office, yes. Uh, Senator Limmer. But we did not have did we or did we not have one from the murdered and missing? Uh, Mr. Turner, Mr. Mr. Madam Mr. Chair, Mr. I do not believe we did for this. Mr. Turner might it's already existing. shed some light on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Uh, Senator, or Mr. Turner. And members, um, two years ago, we uh, put together a task force for missing and murdered African American women funded at $100,000 in fiscal year 22 and $50,000 in fiscal year 23. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Um, and there was no reports. We don't know how the money was spent. We Do we have any guidance as far as? I, I honestly can't recall seeing a report. Okay. Um, and so without recommendations, it's hard to make this mm -hmm. decision. Um, I have our, our staff is looking through their, their files too, and mm -hmm. uh, they're not finding a copy of a report either. I feel There's a, a lot of confusion on this amendment, um, Senator Limmer, and I, I do question, um, not question the validity, I just question whether this needs just to have a more thorough look um, going mm -hmm. forward. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, regardless of the subject content, uh, uh, creating a new office like this would have to go to state gov. Okay. Okay, Senator Limmer. Well, for those uh, reasons, uh, 
blowing the budget, uh, not seeing a report that gave specific recommendations, and then a more involvement in a different jurisdiction, I would have to oppose the amendment. Thank you, Senator Limber. Senator M Marty. Madam, Madam Chair, I think this is worth doing. This was the Senator Kunish bill, and I, I would be glad to have a, a study funded like we did for the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, but I, I'll just bring it forward for the vote and happy to have somebody, if, if Senator Glimmer is open to a study, I would welcome that. Well, Madam Chair, and we, Mr. Author, Limmer, we authorized Senator. a task force and a, and a report uh, what year was it, Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner. Madam Chair, members, uh, fiscal year 22 and into fiscal year 23. So perhaps the report is not written yet because they're still working on it. Okay. Mr. Backus. Uh, Mr. Backus. Mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair, members, I was just looking at the, uh, the language from last year. The report is due on or before December 15th of 2022. So the report has not been made yet. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps we're a little premature on creating an office, Senator Murray. But we can certainly take a vote. Madam Chair. If you'd like. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and just a point of clarity, uh, if, I rem if I recall uh, with the uh, missing indigenous um, women and children, I think that was specifically uh, set up because of the issues that they were having on the reservation, if I recall. Uh, that would, in, I think, make it different than what's before us now. Uh, so I, I agree. I think, I mean, I certainly would, I guess I won't be here to look into it, but nevertheless, I think it probably needs to be looked at. But I think that's where the missing in, indigenous and issue came from was because of the uh, uh, horrible activity that was going on in the reservations. Madam Chair. Senator Limerick. Uh, if we were going to parallel this with the uh, uh, indigenous women or relatives, they now changed it to the term relatives, uh, we would wait for their task force report. Once we get the task force report, we would consider uh, creating an office or creating a, uh, an expanded purpose for leg under legislation. <clears throat> but, uh, and we did wait for their report and so uh, it just seems like the natural order of progression to, if we were to create some kind of office, we would want to make sure that we have the proper direction given to it. And much of that would come from a report. That's right. And, uh, and we're still, the legislature is still waiting for that. I agree. Uh, Senator Lemurn, you've already blown your budget, <laughs> too. <laughs> Senator DeMarty renews his motion on the A55 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, All opposed? No. Motion does not prevail. Senator Murray. Madam Chair, I'll try the A58 amendment, which does deal with the missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Uh, Senator Marty moves the A58 amendment that is posted also. And this one is, is also much smaller amount here. And Madam Chair and Senator Limmer, this is to create a reward fund because they are finding that, well, when you have rewards for people to provide information uh, relating, relevant information that leads to a conviction or resolving a case, um, they found out that they've had some success with this, and this would be some startup funding for, for this purpose. There's also a, I'm not sure the status of it, for missing and murdered indigenous women license plates, which would be providing funding for this on an ongoing basis. But this is sort of startup funds for that, and I believe this is something the, um, the proponents of that are asking for, and I believe it's a, it's a relatively small request to help resolve some of these long cases. And, and the only thing I uh, wanted to make one small correction, Senator Ingebrigtsen thing, yes, there was a lot of terrible things that happened on reservations, but I think the problem for missing and murdered indigenous women has been a statewide problem, not just on reservations. Um, but I, I think this would be a reasonable step forward to help. It's a relatively small amount to help provide some startup funding for a loan, uh, a reward fund. 
that the license funds could be contributing to as well. Thank you, Senator Marty. Um, Senator Marty, is 4% used of available funds used on advertising? What do, is that uh, appropriate? Is that something? Um, that seems like a the lot. The 4%, I, um, Madam Chair, I don't know. I believe this language came from Senator Kunish. She has, she's been trying to work on this. Mm -hmm. It's about 4,000. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Similar thing, Madam Chair. In this amendment, it's creating an advisory group. This would need to be heard in state government in order to be considered. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nauman. Madam Chair, I think the interest was discussing the total cost of the proposed amendment. It's 110,023, and then there would be a tail of 220. So there'd be 330 over three years. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Senator Limmer. Uh, Madam Chair, um, could I ask Senator Marty, what is the source for the money? Um, Mr. Ch uh, Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, this would be general fund. So, um, I thought, uh, Senator Marty, there was some correlation between the, the license tap fees, or li the new license Madam, and this. Madam Chair, I was understanding this was going to be one-time startup funding, not ongoing, but that, that the license funds were going to, it's like a $30 fee for them or something that would uh -huh. be going to this fund. And um, talking with Senator Kunish, that license bill for murder and um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous is in Senator Newman's bill mm -hmm. and in the House. I, I guess, uh, Senator Lemur, I'm, I'm just, and Senator Marty, I'm thinking, number one, that this would have to be seen in, in state gov. Number two, but that maybe this is a little premature too. I'm not, there is a correlation between these license plates and this reward, but I'm not sure if it's correct to implement this right now. Madam, Madam Chair, I, I will withdraw the amendment, but I, I, I wish, I mean, I think that that funding for the yeah. license plates is likely to move ahead, and I think it would, be, it would be helpful to have the fund in place, but I understand that um, it's not likely to happen here in this committee at this time, and I um, will withdraw the amendment and hope that it does get hearings in the appropriate committees, because I... I think that's one of the reasons we try amendments here because we don't get hearings in state government or other committees. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank but you, I Senator Marty. I do know. Um, I do know, Senator Limmer. You've been very supportive of the missing and murdered Indigenous, and you've done a tremendous amount in the past for them, I believe. And yeah. uh, Senator Kunish has recognized that. I do want everybody to know that. Senator Kunish and I have talked. Uh, not only about the progress of the organization, but also this particular uh, amendment or a, something similar to this amendment. And um, uh, we'll continue to talk and visit. Uh, I'll encourage uh, the Senate Trans Transportation Committee to consider this amendment. Uh, up front, I'm a little concerned about a reward advisory group. Uh, there is an office now established for missing and murdered Indian relatives. Uh, they're formally in, have an office and a budget. Uh, perhaps they could take care of that issue without an advisory group of this size, and um, then it wouldn't have to go to another committee. That might be another way to streamline the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Senator Limmer. I do, I do think we're on the right path. I, I did tell uh, Senator Kunish that not as all lost on this one. So we'll continue to work on it. And Senator Marty remo um, withdraws the 58 amendment. Thank you. Other further amendments? Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to offer the A56 amendment. Senator Kent moves the A56 amendment. We do not have that one yet. Yeah. 
Okay, Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a very simple amendment. It um, just frankly adds a little additional money to something that is already in the bill, which is pathway to policing. Um, we've talked a lot in this committee over the past couple of days about the importance of making sure we know that whatever we're investing in has positive results, um, that we can demonstrate that it's effective. And I think we all agree that Pathways to Policing has very much been an effective um, way to bring more people into law enforcement and particularly to bring in a, great, a more diverse population of law enforcement officers and to better reflect the populations of the communities in which they are serving. Um, I uh, refer to um, a, a magazine from the Minnesota Police Chief Association uh, where they uh, profile this program and how successful it has been. Uh, they specifically talked about the efforts in Bloomington. There have been many more applicants than they've been able to handle. And, uh, you know, we keep talking about, we heard testimony earlier today from uh, Commissioner Harrington that, you know, everybody recognizes that um, recruiting um, uh, more law enforcement officers is a good thing, and uh, this seems like something that we should be making an investment in. And so the A56 amendment would um, take the current $1 million um, allocation and increase that by another two to a total of $3 million. Thank you, Senator Kent. Senator Limmer. Well, Madam Chair, um, Pathway to Policing is a good program. Uh, no question about it. When uh, Senator Dayton, or Senator, when, <laughs> when Governor Dayton was in office, uh, we, were, uh, we were insistent as a Senate body to give money to Pathways for Policing. Um, the other chamber did not see our, our wisdom there, but it finally ended up in the final bill. And like you say, Senator Kent, it has been a good program. It's attracted people that are a little out of the ordinary uh, from the historic path of where a police officer should come from. Uh, it recognizes that sometimes policing needs a, a little bit of a fresh perspective. And th those applicants can bring that in. Having said that, um, Senator Rosen, um, again, I go back to my spending limit that leadership has given me. Um, Two million extra dollars uh, goes over my line, and um, even though our line has been now stretched, um, I'm, I'm not really know where to go on this one. Uh, I would have to, under the restrictions that we have in my spending limit, I would have to oppose it unless the committee goes elsewhere. Mr. Gammon. So, Madam Chair, um, the base language itself is tracked at a million dollars with tails. So, simply making a numerical change from one million to three would increase the tails by two million dollars a year. So, the total cost would be six over the three-year projection period. So, Senator Limmer, <laughs> how many more amendments do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Senator Kent? <laughs> um, we did have a very um, deliberative debate about this. And at the time, I mean, we really needed to um, keep, keep it within check. And I do know that Senator Limmer is um, careful about his budget, so my I. I do think, um, can you negotiate on this, Senator Kent? That's my former career, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> How about if we strike three million and put two million? Thank you. Okay? Yes. All right. Yes. Senator Limmer, you good? I'm good. Senator Kent? moves to strike on line two, uh, three million, and insert two million. So moved. 
Thank what you, What would be Pat. the tails figure? Mr. Nauman. Madam Chair, um, under budget rules, we push the tails from the second year of the biennium. So this would be, a, it would have a $2 million tail. You good? Thank you. What am I saying? Thank you. Hold on a second. Oh, thank you. I'm supposed to be the one Madam stopping Chair, all this. It was my turn to say thank you. <laughs> all right. Senator Kent uh, renews our motion on the amended A56. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those aye. opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I would like to offer the A57 amendment. Senator Kent moves the A57 amendment. We don't have it yet, Senator Kent. Senator Kim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the A57 amendment provides survivor benefits um, in the result, and this, this amendment really is a result of the advocacy of a widow of a South St. Paul police officer, uh, Sergeant Corey Slifko. Uh, he died by suicide in 2019, having had a clinical diagnosis of PTSD due to work-related trauma. Um, however, because suicide due to PTSD is not considered death in the line of duty, his family was not able to receive survivor benefits. Um, this bill uses the governor's recommendation for a million dollars to expand these benefits. And according to DPS, there are currently six people that this expansion would affect and allow their families to receive those benefits. Uh, it would be retroactive to January 1st, 2017 to include those families. Um, I would also point out that the amendment um, does specify that a mental health provider must previously diagnose the officer with PTSD and the PTSD must result from the officer's work. And um, uh, as we have talked so much about valuing uh, the people who protect our, and serve our communities, uh, I believe this is um, uh, an important and relatively minor thing we can do to support our, our law enforcement officers and their families. Thank you, Senator Kent. Um, my thoughts here on this one is how, you know, where does the, the pension fit in? There's a lot of moving pieces with that and the PTSD that we've, we've been focusing on also. Senator Limmer. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I have a few questions to ask. Um, this amendment looks somewhat familiar to me, but it looks a little different as well. Um, what would be the benefit to a stricken officer's family? Senator Kim. Um, uh, Senator Limmer, I do know that this was a bill from Senator Bigham, uh, and I don't believe it did have a hearing in your committee, but that may be why it looks familiar to you. Um, that this would be, um, bear with me. My understanding is that this is the similar benefits that um, are killed in the line of duty. Yeah. Madam Chair, Senator um, Limmer. as I recall, um, Senator Duckworth, uh, I believe he had a bill very similar yes. to this prior to Senator Bigham. Yes. Um, I, we considered this during our Judiciary Committee meeting last week. Um, you know, we certainly recognize the dollar amount, but the other uh, element was is we didn't know if the question came up um, what the ongoing costs would be in a tail effect, number one, uh, hard to predict, number two. Um, if I remember right, the award was to be given to various members of a family, not just one family. Uh, disbursement. Um, if there's questions about how it interrelates with a pension, I'm not quite sure. I'm I'm unaware of that, but 
Senator Rosen, you suggest there might be. Um, the other question is, is um, does this apply to just state law enforcement personnel, or would it be county and local? And then my question would be is, are those jurisdictions contributing to this? Do they have their own? Are there insurance policies uh, established by law enforcement agencies already in place as a means of collective bargaining that they're involved? So I'm, I, I haven't studied this area and I'm just wondering, do we want to go down this path right now versus maybe studying it a little bit more? I think we're all sympathetic to the families and we're very grateful for the service of our law enforcement that are fallen. Um, I just want to make sure we do it right. Madam Chair. Sir, can, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so again, we already have provisions for uh, law, uh, law enforcement who are killed in the line of duty and this would just simply expand that to include those who contract PTSD in the line of duty and die by suicide. Um, uh, the, uh, my understanding is that the average death benefit is about $167,000, and as I mentioned, there have been six officers um, who would qualify since 2017, um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's not a, a, a large population that would be added to the existing process. So I would imagine some of the pension conversations would already have been covered in the killed in the line of duty as well as the state and local interactions. Um, and, yeah. and I'm, I, you know, I'm, my understanding is that this did, wasn't discussed in judiciary, but I don't believe it's been given a full hearing, which is one of the challenges when things don't get hearings because then, you know, we don't get some of the fuller uh, conversation. I don't know if Mr. Backus has uh, any additional answers to the, the questions that he would want to share. And Mr. Backus, um, could you also, um, along with that, is there some kind of formula or how, how do they determine who, what family is eligible for this? Um, Mr. Ch this Madam is Chair kind of out of our, the statute for PTSD is out of our, our uh, wheelhouse. Madam Chair, members, uh, this is part of the section 299A, uh, some specific benefits for peace officers and families of peace officers. So I, I don't really know how it interacts with pensions and workers' comp. I, I, I think it just exists separately. But there's a death benefit for the families of officers who are killed in the line of duty. The statutory provision is 100000 but there's a cost of living built into it. And I believe now, as Senator Kent said, it's up to like 160 something thousand. Uh, in terms of the, the people who would be eligible under this particular provision, if you look at uh, page two, uh, there's a definition of public safety officer, and it, it's a broader ge definition in general for the benefits, but for this specific uh, benefit for peace, the families of peace officers who have committed suicide, it includes on line 2.17 peace officers, 2.8 correction officers, 2.220 uh, the, the firefighters, 2.27 those volunteer firefighters, and then 3.7 the first responders, and 3.12 uh, those other individuals. So it's, it's a slightly more narrow version that's applicable for the killed in the line of duty benefits via suicide. Senator Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And I would just also point out that uh, in um, Part C, starting on line 1.29, it specifies that the, uh, a licensed mental health provider would have pre pre previously diagnosed the officer with PTSD and that their mental health provider determined that the PTSD resulted from their work as a public safety officer. Thank you, Senator Kent. I do know, um, like I said, we've been working a little bit in pensions on this issue, and there seems to be just one law firm that works on these PTSD um, and diagnosis, and it, I think this is a little, this needs to be vetted a little bit more, 
and teased out, I believe. That's my recommendation. Um, not that certainly um, it's not a worthy cause, but there are t many other things I think that can play into this arena, and I think we need to get more information on that. So, Senator Limmer, your thoughts? Well, Matter, Madam Chairman. Um, Chairwoman, but that's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Chairwoman. <laughs> um, uh, I'm kind of at the mercy of your committee. Um, I understand the need for a little more vetting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like uh, Mr. Ba ba Backus. Uh, I'm not well versed in the interconnection between a pension or any other benefit. Uh, I now that we have a, known that there is a death benefit already in existing law, uh, I would agree with you. We probably need a little more betting on the issue. It's not to say we're not sympathetic or we wouldn't eventually go there. It's just we need a little more information. Thank you. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I agree. I think this needs more vetting. And here's the reasons why. I, I know there's a death benefit for, for the state. Uh, I think, and I'm not sure, uh, but I'll, I know from previous experience, but it's been years ago since my partner was killed in the line of duty. Uh, there was a matching fund that came from the federal government when he was killed in the line of duty. Uh, so I'm not sure what this would do for that. Um, but I know this post-traumatic stress thing is, is something relatively new, mm -hmm. as you well know, Madam Chair. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it has to be truly, truly um, vetted. Uh, uh, and I'm not saying... <laughs> And I'm not saying that, that I, don't, I don't trust somebody who claims they are or has diagnosed that because, um, you know, there's, there's some terrible things out there that, that officers see. Um, but, you know, it just all of a sudden came, came about just recently in the last two or three years. And, and uh, I, I think to, to some, some of the stuff I, you know, I think might be a little bit of an over, overreaction. And I, I say that cautiously because I, I don't... I don't, uh, I, I certainly feel sympathy for those that would, you know, end up uh, taking their own life. Um, but it just seems like it really needs an awful lot of work. And I'm not sure what you're doing with, with pensions on this, but I know there's some disability stuff that's going on. And, and uh, well, we're getting into an area that's going to potentially start costing a lot of money. And, and, uh, so I, I, I can't, I can't, personally I can't support this, but uh, it certainly needs a lot of work and I, I won't be here to do that, but nevertheless I'm sure whoever is will be, will be dealing with it in the, in the future. Thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Senator Kent. Oh, Senator Martin. Madam Chair, I, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I think in terms of how this interrelates with pensions, it would relate to any other public safety officer who dies, who is killed in the line of duty. This is just simply saying that these folks who died as a suicide related to PTSD from their job are treated as the same as if they were killed in the line of duty because it's, in effect, killed in the line of duty. So I don't think he's saying that we don't know what the impact of federal benefits or pension benefits are. It's the same as any other officer who's killed in the line of duty. We're just saying expanding to say that if you had PTSD and it led to suicide, that that's treated the same way as anybody else who's killed in the line of duty. So can't you just um, add the suicide and not the a million dollars of the cost associated? No, onto the list. Because the if if the officer dies of a heart attack or stroke, a vascular rupture, um, I do know the work that's been done in pensions, and we had a full hearing last year on PTSD. There is a lot of work on duty disability, uh, but from Senator Howe and others, um, and and the workers' comp issue. There is one lawyer that determines whether they have PTSD or not. And that's a whole nother ball game right here. We've, and it's, it's a problematic situation. Um, again, I think this is, um, with, with a clear conscience, I don't think it'd be good to, to vote this through. Senator Kent. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, you know, alternatively, uh, because this hasn't had a full hearing, 
um, but it is important. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have a letter from Mrs. Slifko. Um, another option would be to include it and let's keep working on it and answer those questions. It's still early April and we do have time to work on these things. And if, if we can't satisfactorily answer those questions, mm -hmm. you know, we can, we can evolve as we need to. Well, thank you, Senator DeCant. I do think the million dollar cost is probably um, what is prohibitive. I didn't get a clear explanation how that is going to be. Um, is it just for those six members or six officers that they would be eligible, that million dollar split? Is it a pool of money? How is it determined that it, how that's going to be uh, allocated? So, as I said, I think this needs a little bit more work. And um, again, I think. Uh, this is premature. For the comments? Senator Kent renews her motion on the A57 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay? No. Motion does not prevail. Further amendments? Senator Lopez Ranzen, Senator Champion did a very good job on your, on your amendment. You blew the target. No, well, there isn't a target. Our session priorities. <laughs> Senator uh, Rose and Senator Limmer, and I really appreciate the just contemplating uh, adding additional dollars for youth intervention. It, I think it's overall we're supporting law enforcement, but we also want to support our, our youth. So I think it's really important. So I appreciate Madam Chair for including that. And, and we'll debate more on the conference because I think there's differences with the House, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Lopez Ranson. Of course. <laughs> Any further comments? We'll go to Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for hearing this bill. Um, we're in a position where I think uh, we've never had the outbreak of violent crime as we have seen in recent years. It preceded the death of uh, George Floyd, and it was on the rise about a year and a half to two years prior to that. Um, certainly the George Floyd death contributed uh, an emotional uh, uh, acceleration uh, but uh, after, after this time has passed, since that date, uh, crime is now uh, becoming much more commonplace. Over the weekend, um, there were three, three or four cities, that the streets were literally taken over by uh, people who wanted to speed down streets, uh, do spin outs in key intersections, and the police were rather helpless to uh, stop it. Uh, they're simply outnumbered by a large number of cars and, and people. Uh, we're, we're, we seem to be growing into a lawless uh, society in parts of Minneapolis and St. Paul, as well as suburbs. Some of the suburban freeways are becoming drag strips every night. Um, but it doesn't, that's a, the minor element of the crime. Uh, we, we still are experiencing record number of deaths record number of firearm use in the commission of a crime, uh, a continual pattern that judges 40% of the time are not uh, imposing uh, prison time for those who use a gun in the commission of a crime. When I tell that to my constituents, you can hear a collective gasp in the audience every time I say it. Uh, our people expect reaction, proper reaction from our law enforcement and from our cities. Uh, this bill will give uh, those jurisdictions the tools and the resources necessary. It will also bring accountability to some of those functions and, and some um, transparency to the court system, including prosecutors and judges uh, who continue to file mistrials. Uh, and dismissals, or uh, dismissals, I mean, not uh, mistrials. Um, and so um, this bill uh, focuses on the immediate need of what we need to focus on uh, in our society. We need to give law enforcement the tools necessary. Um, some people will say we should direct money in other directions. That may be true. 
but the moment now is to help our law enforcement and to bring a little bit more law and order to our streets. Um, I, we don't want to see little kids being hit by stray gunfire. Gunfire alone shouldn't even be in our society, let alone stray gunfire um, taking the lives of our children. Uh, so uh, having said that, Madam Chair, um, the bill is before us, and I hope you would join us in a united manner uh, to put that message straight forward. Thank you, Senator Lemmer. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, on that, I, I guess I'm wondering, because the, the bottom line, what, where you're expecting these things to end up, because we still, as we've talked about the lack of targets or whatever you're calling them, priorities, or, but um, I didn't ask about it earlier and I didn't have an amendment for it, but like with the, um, there are a lot of other areas that this budget would normally cover, like we do increase, and I appreciate the increase in, in public defenders and, and all the other court portions, but like there's nothing for legal services, civil legal services, and, and that would be a costly thing to bring up too, but it's, it's important for the court's functioning. But then even with, the, with all of the things on the public safety, I'm convinced that a lot of the stuff in here is going to do nothing to change the public safety. And some of the things that uh, commissioners were mentioning about the fact that we don't have, we had that horrific story, that woman and her daughter who were held up by somebody who wouldn't have been out there except for the fact that there was no data sharing between rural counties and the, the probation officers in various counties. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what are you, uh, a lot of the things in here strike me as spending a lot of money and the, you look the tails two years, four years, six years out and they're just horrendously high tails for something I don't think is gonna make a big difference. And yet the things that we could be doing like the data sharing, the, the informational things, there are a lot of provisions I think the, the agencies had put forward that weren't considered that would make our streets safer. In this bill, it's the same kind of things that were tried 30 years ago that didn't work. So I guess I'm, I'm troubled by that, but I'm wondering, Madam Chair, what, where do you expect the number is gonna be for this? Is this, you got roughly 200 million in here. Um, is there gonna be more chance to do some of the things that would make a bigger difference? Or is this the, what you're envisioning for the final thing for public safety? Well, Senator Lerner. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Marty, um, again, I have to remind our Senate that this is an off year. Our budget, budget year comes up every other year, uh, first year in a biennium. Uh, we committed an increase of 21% to civil legal last year, and now they want more but they always want more and, and probably is a le legitimate request. Um, we have focused on some of these items that you are focusing on as well. Um, next year is a budget year, just like uh, last year was, and we will be revisiting uh, some of these major commitments again. Uh, the areas for infrastructure and or data infrastructure is important. But as I said before, the immediate need uh, when you have a, a shortfall of police officers, when you have a law enforcement community that's been so um, demoralized because of the action of one or two people, uh, there is a condemnation over an entire law enforcement profession. And I think we have to be cautious about that because now we have police officers now experiencing uh, PTSD that they've never had before. Many of them are, are uh, filing for early retirement. Uh, we have some of our major cities having record-breaking violent crime uh, going on and it has continued uh, for quite a long time, but now it's getting to the point that it is at a crisis moment. We don't have, we, we have fewer and fewer people entering into the field of law enforcement. The, um, even our school uh, law enforcement programs are getting smaller and smaller in enrollment. 
If we don't stem this tide now, if you think you have a problem now with crime, you're gonna have a tidal wave of crime in the next few years. This has to be addressed right now. And we are recognizing that immediate need in this budget. Next year will come along and we'll, we'll uh, I, I, I hope if I'm still here and I'm influential in it, we can address those needs. Um, We've taken uh, what resources we have and we've directed, directed it into uh, the transparency, the enforcement, the accountability, and with the proper resourcing to get this job done as soon as we can. Um, I don't know how much more I can explain it, but uh, we, are, we are trying to address the immediate need that we have at this moment. If we lose this moment, we will pay dearly for it. Senator Marty. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, the Department of Corrections data request strikes me as a pretty urgent one for public safety. I mean, that horrific story we heard. I, I think the issue, I'm frustrated by the fact that we have so many people on probation and, and supervision that don't get the mental health treatment they need. And, no attempt to do anything with that. Uh, to me, I guess I'm wondering, the reason I'm asking about the bottom line is end of this week, or actually I guess the week after break, we'll have passed out all the finance bills. And I'm wondering, because it strikes me that there's a lot of money left on the bottom line after we pass all these bills. And some of those issues ought to be addressed. And to me, those are things that we ought to be doing to increase the safety, and they do more than some of these other things. I'm not arguing that we have to recruit more police officers, and I think we should be addressing the PTSD thing as Senator Kent's amendment did. But I'm wondering, because I think we're going to have <laughs> unknown amount to us, because we don't have any targets or what your priorities are, but we, we're going to have some amount on the bottom line after we finish these bills, and I'm kind of wondering where that is and when we're going to have a chance to talk about that and whether we can make some of these investments that Commissioner of Corrections and Public Safety and others are saying we ought to be doing to improve safety, make the community safer, which is what you say is your goal. Madam Chair. Senator, Senator Limmer. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Marty, you and I probably arrive at the same conclusion of what we need. Uh, you brought up the mental health history of this state. Uh, you and I were, I think, mostly in office at the time 35 years ago when this state made it a policy to dismantle a lot of the infrastructure of institutional mental health facilities. And this state has done little to replace those resources. And so those individuals um, end up commonly in jails and prisons. Uh, where they either are victims or they are the ones who victimize others in those facilities. When I was a correction officer, I dealt with those individuals. And that is not the place for a, someone with a mental health issue. But, but to say that this issue is now climaxing for some purpose, uh, or from, for some reason, this has been going on a long, long time. And this state fails uh, continuously to, to apply resources to that area. That's not the jurisdiction in this committee that I'm, that I'm dealing with. That's the Health and Human Service uh, Committee to direct those resources in that direction. You and I are in agreement. We would love to have a risk-free, safe environment for every man, woman, and child in our state. But Deep down, let's be real. There are individuals that will victimize, they will stalk, and they are predators. And unfortunately, they are becoming younger and younger. And we have prosecutors that will not prosecute low-level crime. And law enforcement has said over and over again, if you ignore the little problems, they become big problems. They do not go away. This bill will help go in that direction. It's not a cure-all for everything, nor is any bill. Um, Madam Chair, I have to let it rest there. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Senator Limmer. Yeah. Senator Kent. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, Senator Limmer, you said, well, hopefully because next year's a budget year, we'll be able to come back and deal with the, the data infrastructure uh, then. Again, I'm gonna bang on the pots and pans I've been banging on for a while now. Um, we don't have the context of knowing that, but you know, we did finally lay eyes on a tax bill yesterday that is $5 billion in the next biennium. I bet that gets bigger even further into the out years. And based on what I know about this surplus, that can't leave a whole lot left of a structural surplus moving forward. And um, you know, I, speaking of mental health, something that I have worked on when it comes to our kids since I've been in office, um, the other body has just recommended a proposed a significant investment in the long-standing complete lack of support for our kids in our schools in terms of counselors, uh, social workers, psychologists, and nurses, the very people who can help deal with youth mental health at an early stage and catch it and make it better. So if we don't even have a structural surplus, probably to deal with inflation, never mind long-standing problems like the lack of student support professionals, how are we gonna fund these, this um, data infrastructure that you're saying that hopefully we can do next year? Again, these are theoretical questions because I haven't actually seen the double super secret um, spreadsheet, but, you know, and neither have any Minnesotans, uh, but, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Senator Limmer, but I don't see how that adds up. And I feel like, once again, we're gonna kick the can down the road on some of these things, which effectively means we're not gonna deal with it until it becomes an even bigger public safety problem, and it becomes even harder to solve in, in terms of, of what it will take to, financially to, to do that. Um, but that's just my two cents on that particular topic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kent. Well, there is um, just just a couple quick uh, comments, and then we'll take a vote here. But uh, just my conversations with Mayor Fry, on I flat out asked him, "What what can we do for you?" And he says, "I need law enforcement. I need bodies. I need some help." And that's what your bill does focus on, is public safety, Senator Limmer. And we did, we are supporting the recruitment, the retention. Uh, we're, we're dealing with that in the pension bill. We're dealing with PTSD in the pension bill. We're doing many things to support this great need out there. And as you know, our, our focus for the Republican caucus is to give it back. You know, obviously we're collecting too many taxes. We're giving it back. Um, if anybody's seen the billboards out there, if anybody goes into my district, that's what they're saying, give the money back. And that's what we're doing with the tax bill. And of course, the literacy and education uh, piece is important also. Um, Senator Kent, we do have a very strong mental health bill that is marching through. It um, left Senator Utke's committee, and I believe it is in finance soon. And it deals with uh, your work on schooling mental health. You can't buy, borrow, or steal a counselor or a psychologist anymore. So we did significant funding for school linked mental health, continue the telepresence part of it, uh, shelter linked for the, for the homeless youth. It's a very impressive mental health bill, bipartisan, extremely. Urgency rooms that Senator Dreheim and Senator uh, Isaacson worked on, Senator France has pieces in there. I mean, it's... Um, it's, it's going to be good, and it's still being adjusted, but there is a significant um, allocation for that bill. So um, we, are, we are moving forward, and I think we have a very strong bill to go into negotiations with Senator Limmer. I think you did exactly what uh, uh, the majority of the people in Minnesota wanted, the uh, majority of the people in my district wanted, and I really appreciate your work on this bill. Um, thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Backus, for your work, too. I know it's been a, um, a long couple days here with... How long did you go last Friday? You must have gone all day, mm -hmm. right? Seven or eight hours. Seven or eight hours. Oh, not too bad. Okay. Madam so, Chair. any further comments? Senator just, Kent. Just one final question, you know, on this question. And I don't... Uh, what will be left on the bottom line after we pass all the omnibus bills? Would you like to know what we've already spent? I'd like to know what will be left on the bottom line after we pass all the omnibus bills. I can tell you what we've already spent. <laughs> so, Mr. Nelman. 
Madam Chair and Senator Kent, um, I know this wasn't exactly what you asked, but um, $3.274 billion as of yesterday, this bill will, that's over, that's over all four years, has been spent. Um, you would add to that, Mr. Turner will correct me if I get this wrong, um, a little over $450 million over four years on this bill. Sir, Madam Chair, I, I would just say, um, and thank you, Mr. Nauman, but uh, this is just a real lack of transparency that I don't think is appropriate for the people of Minnesota, and I, I think it does a disservice to those of us, again, who are being asked to vote on these bills and significant amounts of funding without understanding the roadmap, without understanding any of the bigger picture context. Um, you know, I know it's not a budget year. I know our rules do not require us to create targets, but the reason we do create those targets is because they are public and we all know what we're working with. And um, the, the lack of that in this particular session, I think is highly problematic. Thank you. Oh, Senator Kent, I, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, if it was up to the majority of the caucus, I believe they would want to give 100% of this money back because apparently we are collecting too many taxes. So um, we, we had a very good discussion about other priorities and listened to, to folks out there, and uh, public safety is right up there, number one, number two on the list. So. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 2673 as amended to pass and refer to the general orders. On Senator Ingebrigtsen. As amended. As amended, thank you. On Senator Ingebrigtsen motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Yeah, absolutely. So, members, tomorrow we have started at 8.30 again, and we have, we have, what was it Tomorrow we have um, Senator Newman's transportation bill, Senate File 1154, the uh, Senator Lang's vets bill, Senate File 3875, and Senator Kiffmeyer's bill, 70, Senate File 3975. Very good. With that, any, and we will try to give you a heads up as far as when we're going to recess, give you time to figure out your schedule. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, members.